the very first lecture of the 46th annual uh, Perspectives in Military History, History Lecture Series. Each year, the Army Heritage and Education Center and the War College sponsor the Perspective Series to provide a historical dimension to the exercise of generalship, strategic leadership, and the warfighting institutions of land power. This year's lectures will cover a wide range of topics from the Chesapeake Campaign during the War of 1812 to fresh looks at the U.S. Army's history with counterinsurgency. We will cover officer training in World War I, American strategy in Afghanistan, and the Cold War legacy of the U.S. Army. I hope that you all can attend each exciting lecture that we have planned this year. I do have a few administrative announcements before we get started. First, please remember to turn off your cell phones or at least silence them. Second, next month is uh, our Perspectives Lecture will be our annual General of the Army Omar N. Bradley Lecture. Uh, this year we're very proud to have Mr. Rick Atkinson to give us the lecture based on his newest book, the third in his Liberation Trilogy, uh, The Guns at Last Light, The War in Western Europe, 1944 to 1945. The lecture is on September 11th, but please make note that it's going to be over in Bliss Hall at the War College. Uh, parking will be available at Ann Eli Hall over there, but we'll also have our parking lot open right here. You can come, park here between 6 and 7 o'clock, catch a shuttle bus over to uh, Bliss Hall, and then, of course, uh, from uh, 8 to 9, we'll have the shuttle bus running back here. Uh, so if you don't want to worry about getting on post and all of that, you can come here and, uh, and see us on the shuttle bus. This weekend, Saturday the 24th, we will present a program called Mysteries in Military History. Uh, imagine an antique road show uh, for your military history items. We'll have representatives from all parts of uh, the U.S. Uh, Army Heritage and Education Center, from some of our very best research uh, historians to some of the curators. Uh, they'll be all right here in multi-purpose rooms uh, to tell you a little bit about any history on any military items you might have lying around up in an attic, something that belonged to your grandfather or great-grandfather. Bring it on in. We'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, even if you don't have anything to bring in, come on in. You might see some pretty strange stuff that somebody else brought in. Uh, and then lastly, before we get started here, please remember that the 2013 USAHEC photo contest is still going on. We'll continue uh, accepting entries until September 30th. The contest is open to anyone associated with the War College, the uh, Carlisle Barracks, or any Army installation in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the contest categories or the rules, uh, please visit our front desk before you leave today, or you can go to our website at www.usahec.org. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with that website. So with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Dr. Conrad C. Crane is currently the Chief of Historical Services for us here at the USAHEC. For the past 10 years, however, he was the Director of the U.S. Army Military History Institute. Before MHI, Dr. Crane served with the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College from September 2000 to January 2003, where he held the General Douglas MacArthur Chair of Research. He has also held the General Hoyt S. Vandenberg Chair of Aerospace Studies at the War College. He joined SSI after his retirement from active military service. Dr. Crane served for 26 years, concluding with nine years as a professor of history at the United States Military Academy. He holds a Bachelor of Science from the U.S. Military Academy, as well as a Master of Arts and a Ph.D. from Stanford University. He is also a graduate of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and the U.S. Army War College. Dr. Crane has authored or edited books and monographs on the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and has written or lectured widely on air power and land power issues. Before leaving SSI, he co-authored a pre-war study on reconstructing Iraq that influenced Army planners and has attracted much attention from the media. He was also the lead author for the Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Manual released in December 2006. For that effort, he was named one of Newsweek's People to Watch in 2007. In November 2008, he was named the International Archivist of the Year by the Scone Foundation. Tonight, Dr. Crane will speak to us about the choices surrounding the uses of weapons of mass destruction during the Korean War. I present Dr. Conrad Crane. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thank you very much. Really, I'm, uh, I'm just the warm-up for Rick Atkinson. So, try to get everybody primed for next month. 
Uh, this is actually a class that is designed to fit in with the current War College curriculum for students and faculty. The, the folk, right now the students are going through their strategic leadership course and the focus tonight is going to be on ethical and leadership issues during the Korean War. Uh, focus on weapons of mass destruction, gives me a chance to tell some stories, I'm going to read some documents. Uh, and again, this is again just a sense to get you into the year, get you set for Rick. Uh, and uh, let me talk about Curtis LeMay, which I always love to do. Uh, let me start out and talk about the, the, some of the key people that will be the focus of my brief, fairly brief remarks tonight. On the left, that is my idol, Curtis LeMay, chomping on a cigar, as he often did. Uh, this is a, actually a picture taken as he's in charge of the Berlin Airlift. Now we remember LeMay for incinerating Japanese children at the end of World War II. Well here he's dropping candy to German children in the Cold War. Very versatile kind of guy. Uh, uh, the quintessential Cold Warrior. Uh, if you did, an get, did a decision making model for LeMay, he is a pure systems analyst. There really is not a moral component in his logic except winning. To him, morality is victory. But at the same time, he, he, he often gets a bad rap in the media. Uh, in Dr. Strangelove, he's not Jack D. Ripper, he's Buck Turgeson. He's not going to start World War III, but by God, he's going to win it if we get into, it, into one. Uh, he's going to be a key player throughout this the, the period I'm going to talk about. At that point, he is in charge of Strategic Air Command. And in one of the great transformational leadership performances in history, which ranks right up there with what Matt Ridgway does with the 8th Army in Korea, he turns SAC from a bunch of stumble bums in the late 40s into probably the world's elite fighting force by the, by the, the, the middle of the 50s. And he's in the process of doing that during the, uh, during the Korean War. On the right is Dwight Eisenhower. This is December 1952. President-elect Eisenhower is visiting Korea, fulfilling his campaign promise. And he is going to be a key figure in this discussion as well. And the, but especially concerning the decisions he makes about nuclear weapons uh, in Korea. He kind of starts it. In 19, he starts thinking about nuclear weapons in 1950 and will have certain, a certain influence on the way the war ends, and we'll talk about his interpretation of how the war ends and who, how nuclear weapons play a part in that. Some other people are key leaders. Uh, Dwight Eyes, or, Dwight Eyes, Douglas MacArthur, who was commander, Far East Command, from the beginning of the war in the summer of 1950 until April 1951 when he, when he is relieved. Uh, another guy who gets a bad rap in the historical accounts and in the media about the war. Uh, MacArthur gets blamed for a lot of ideas about nuclear weapons and a lot of cavalier talk about nuclear weapons when if you look at the historical record, all the things he sent to the Joint Chiefs about nuclear weapons were in reply to questions from the Joint Chiefs about nuclear weapons. He didn't initiate any of it. It's all in response to questions, but that is normally ignored by historians who Douglas MacArthur bashing has become a, a cottage industry. On the right, Matthew Ridgway, who succeeds the command, takes over Far East Command from Eisenhower, or from, Eisenhower, from MacArthur in 1951, uh, and has to deal both with the biological warfare issue and with nuclear weapons issues during his period uh, in charge of Far East Command, which basically goes from, the, from April 51 until the summer of 1952, when he gets replaced by Mark Clark. On the right, that's Mark Wayne Clark, uh, a typical vainglorious shot of himself. Uh, he took over in Korea in the summer of 52 and ratcheted up Ridgeway's policies, very hardline negotiator with the communists, and, they, and, and came up with a plan. I'll talk about Op Plan 8-52 to end the war, which required a considerable use of nuclear weapons. On the left, and that not, a, not the best picture I could find, that, that's Otto P. Whelan. He was the commander of the Far East Air Forces from 1951 to 1953. 
interesting character in an Air Force that was dominated by the strategic bomber guys. Wayland is a tactical fighter pilot. I mean, he's a fighter bomber guy. During World War II, Wayland is Patton's airman. He commands the tactical fighter, the, the tactical air command that, that basically guards Patton's flank and his drive across France. He knows what it takes to support ground forces. He's one of the few people of that ilk who survive in the Air Force of the post-World War II. Most of those guys, like Elwood Quesada, are basically purged out of the Air Force. They don't want those guys because everything's going to be strategic bombers. Whalen survives, and all of a sudden in the Korean War, the Air Force realizes it needs to relearn how to do those sort of things, and Whalen returns to prominence and, again, is in charge of Far East Air Forces in 51 to 53. He deals with some of the, the nuclear issues, but in, in more important for this story is he gets wrapped up very much in the biological warfare controversy that, that goes on in 1952 and 1953. Now, we'll start with the, start with the nuke story. Well, we'll, we'll, I, let me set the ethical leadership overview for this because I'm trying to deal with some of the, the DCLM learning objectives. The leaders involved here, basically from Presidents Truman and Eisenhower at the top all the way down to the operation level commanders like Wayland and MacArthur and Ridgeway and Clark, are trying to wrestle with these issues. You know, and, and, and also their staffs. And a lot of the research that I've done really goes into a lot of the staff studies that are done, especially by the Joint Chiefs and in Far East Command, on how to use these weapons. You know, the, the question of atomic weapons, is it uh, atomic weapons justified both by practicality and morality? And I'll talk about some of the studies and some of the implications that come out in some of these, these, these almost agonizing staff studies that get done sometimes. Are biological weapons different? Are they the same as atomic weapons, or are they different? Uh, again, can you, are, is their use justified? And I've got some really interesting observations on that from some, some rather surprising people that I'll talk about later on. I also want to talk about lawfare. You know, in many ways, this is the first wide-scale use of lawfare, which is that you'll see that in a lot of literature. You know, it's trying to use legal, ethical, international law to limit military actions by a belligerent, usually us. And you have a lot of that going on. What is the purpose of the communist biological warfare allegations that start in 1952, and how do they restrain us, and how do we respond to those kind of accusations? And I think there's some lessons or some insights we can draw from that. Now, I want to, this is my prop for tonight, which is a Cheerios box. And I learned this from teaching plebe history at West Point. To keep the plebes awake, especially for classes after lunch, you had to have something to keep them interested. So you throw something out, and... Usually I had a drawer, and I'd have something in the drawer, and they know that sometime during class I'd pull something out of the drawer. I mean, my favorite, their favorite one was during the Whiskey Rebellion. I pulled out a bottle of Jack Daniels, and of course they all ran out and said, oh, look, look, look what Captain Crane's got in the classroom. That caused quite a stir. But uh, so anyway, my prop is this Cheerios box. I'm going to sit it up here, and by the end of the lecture, you'll understand the relevance of that Cheerios box to, to what I'm talking about. Okay, let's talk, talk about atomic bombs. June 25th, 1950, the North Koreans attack across the parallel. If you, if you dig into the records and get a copy of the, the, the first meeting at Blair House that, that Harry Truman holds with his advisors, uh, where Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, starts talking about the situation and what the President can consider, which is the First, they talk about getting supplies to General MacArthur. General MacArthur should, MacArthur should visit the, uh, the, the area of operations. Uh, and then the chairman, the first thing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is Omar Bradley, says is, we must draw the line somewhere. And, and Bradley immediately turns discussion to the Russians. You know, that the, you know, and, and the big discussion is, what do we do about the Russians? And the, uh, you know, the, the, everybody's saying the Russians really don't know, want war now. They're testing us. They start talking about the Russian fleet. And then it goes to General Vandenberg. And the president asked General Vandenberg, can we knock out their air bases in the Far East? And General Vandenberg says, we can do it if we use atomic bombs. So atomic bombs come up for discussion on the very first day of the war. And the discussion kind of floats around it. They're not quite ready to deal with that yet and it kind of fades from there. 
However, later that week, on the 28th of June, the Pentagon is visited by no, none other than General Dwight Eisenhower, back from his stint in Europe as the commander of SHAPE. Uh, and and in, in Matt Ridgway's papers, he has a memorandum he wrote about that visit. Ridgway's papers are one of the great treasures of MHI, if anybody's done research here, I know some of you have. Uh, he did very painstaking memorandums at almost the, at the end of each day, whether he was in, in, the, in the Army staff or whether he was in Korea as a commander. And he was the Army G1 at this point. And he writes this little memorandum on the 28th of June, 1950. General Eisenhower dropped in first in the presence of General Hayslip and me, and later substantially in the same vein as the presence of General Collins. General Collins is the Army Chief of Staff. Hayslip is one of his key assistants, as is General Grunther, who's also there. And Eisenhower stated in most vigorous language and with great emphasis his feeling we ought at once to begin partial mobilization, perhaps reinforce our European forces by a division or two, publicly increase our security measures throughout the country at once, remove the limitation placed on MacArthur to operate south 38th parallel, and consider the use of one or two atomic bombs in the Korean area. Now what's revealing about this is if you read Eisenhower's memoirs, when he talks about World War II, one of the things he says in his memoirs is, I really didn't like the use of the atomic bomb against the Japanese. Of course, it's easy to write, you know, years after the fact. But here's on the 28th of June, 1950, he shows up in the Pentagon, and the very first thing he wants to talk about is dropping nukes in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and, and uh, you know, if suitable targets could be found, he noted. Ridgway notes, he expressed himself as feeling so strongly on these matters he wanted to immediately present his views to General Bradley. And one of the things I found looking back at this incident through some, of, some other sources, as soon as Bradley heard Eisenhower was coming to visit, he basically called in sick and went home. Uh, Bradley always showed it was very timid in dealing with either Eisenhower or MacArthur. And there's a, there's a great book I think we've written about Bradley's period as chairman of the Joint Chiefs. But he basically went home. And Ridgway said, at my urging, we called General Bradley's quarters, where he, where he was confined because of reported illness, only to learn from Mrs. Bradley he was asleep. General Eisenhower informed Mrs. Bradley he would not disturb her husband. Instead, he'd write him a letter, which he then dictated to General Hayslip and left that for General Bradley. And then he went around the whole Army staff talking about how to use A-bombs in Korea. I mean, very enthusiastic. It doesn't sound like a guy who, who, was, who did not like the use of the A-bomb in the Pacific in World War II. But that starts everybody thinking about it. And on the 9th of July, Bradley brings it up in a meeting of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and says, we need to consider, do we need to use atomic weapons in the Korean Peninsula? And what happens is, and in July and August, the Army and the Air Force staffs in the Pentagon are deeply embroiled in studies about the use of atomic weapons in Korea. I mean, I've got reams of paper about those studies. Uh, which, is, which is unusual. Because one of the problems with dealing with anything uh, in the archives about nuclear weapons is nuclear weapon information is exempt from declassification. So generally, if, if documents dealing with atomic weapons or hydrogen weapons are generally classified forever. If they discuss defects, if they're just talking general topics, you might still find some. And I found a whole bunch of stuff in the records with, with all the staff studies done by these four majors and lieutenant colonels in the Pentagon. That's back in the days when cap all captains did was really make coffee. Not like today where captains are making policy decisions. But uh, anyway, all these staff studies talking that agonizingly go through the evaluation of a use of atomic weapons in Korea. Now, they, there is enough of a fear. Remember, things don't go so well in July 1950. And we actually deploy nuclear-capable aircraft and bombs to Guam until September. We actually deploy them to the theater. Now, we don't send the cores. They're bombs without the nuclear cores. Those are actually kept in the United States for now. But the idea is that they're there in case they have to be used if we decide that, those, that such weapons are, uh, are of utility and may be necessary. Now, let's talk about the studies a little bit. It was interesting going through them. The, the studies all concluded that, you know, we can drop the bombs on Korea all we want, but the real targets we want to hit are all in China and Russia. 
doesn't do us a whole lot of good to, to tear up the Korean countryside. And there's, there's one interesting one that talks about that, that actually the use of atomic weapons in Korea, no matter where we dropped it in Korea, would look like a butcher discarding his morals because of the havoc that would be wreaked in the peninsula and anyone near with those, if those bombs were used. I mean, it's a very... Usually, the term moral is not used in the studies. It was striking. If you wanted to talk about anything that we would call an ethical uh, criteria, it's usually called psychological in the studies. Interesting. You know, there's psychological reasons we shouldn't use the bomb. When we read them, they're usually moral and ethical reasons, but they call them psychological. Uh, a number of the studies point out that the big problem with dropping the bombs in the mountainous area of Korea is they might not live up to expectations. The, 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 the bomb effects could be restricted. We may drop a dud. If something like that happens, we're going to lose credibility with our, our nuclear deterrent. It's better to leave such things in the mind of the enemy and not give them anything real to look at. Uh, so that's a big argument, that this is not good terrain to use these kind of weapons. Again, the general conclusions are that military use is unwarranted because there was no good targets and also is questionable from political and psychological points of view. You know, obviously, political, you can understand, everybody predicted the political backlash if we use an atomic weapon throughout the world. Uh, now, however, the studies do conclude that if we're about to be thrown off the peninsula, the best way to assure our safety would be to nuke the heck out of whatever forces are trying to push it off. So the, the studies do conclude that we should be prepared to use atomic weapons, and the exact wording is to avert impending disaster. And what that means is we're about to be thrown off the peninsula. Now, Le Curtis LeMay, he said... There's no use in using the bombs in, in, in Korea because all it is is going to be a great laboratory for the Russians to get all kinds of great information about how we use the weapons and, and how they operate. It's a free laboratory for them. We don't want to give them any free information. So that's his big argument. He says, if we're going to use the nukes, we're going to use them on Russia and China. Let's not give any free samples in Korea. That's kind of the, the Curtis LeMay logic involved in this. Now... So, so to, to avert a pending disaster is the conclusion, and the bombs are taken off the shelf, at least until November, when the Chinese pop up again. We have the big invasion, the big Chinese incursion. There's more, the, the, the Eighth Army is, butchered, is, is battered and driven south. MacArthur is again queried about the use of atomic bombs. He said, yeah, if I had, I could use about 30 to stop the, the push south. Uh, Truman gets up and makes a speech that all weapons are on the table, which causes a major impact, not in Moscow or Beijing, but in London. Clement Attlee is terrified, and on behalf of the European allies, shows up in Washington to plead with Truman not to use atomic weapons. And Truman backs off and says, well, I may have misspoken. We're not prepared to do that at this time. But... Uh, the uh, National Security Council starts to consider which Chinese cities we should take out with atomic bombs. Uh, some of the staff officers in the Air Force basically uh, set up a plan to create a strip of radioactive waste across North Korea to keep the Chinese from coming south. So they can figure how, many, you know, how much radioactive waste we put out there, how long is it going to last. Uh, it's seriously considered. Uh, again, LeMay is against the use of atomic weapons in Korea. But he does say, if we're going to use them, then SAC is going to drop them. I will do it. And so there's a big battle over control of the weapons between LeMay, Far East Command, and actually a bunch of civilians in, in Washington that don't trust the military at all. The big fear is in March and April 1951. The, there's a, if any of you know with the Korean War, there's a massive Chinese offensive at that time. There are Soviet submarines assembled at Vostok. There are new aircraft shifts of actually some jet bombers in Manchuria. It looks like they're, they're getting ready to come across. MacArthur's relief makes the situation even worse because we feel it's making us look more vulnerable. And they, they, at that point in April 1951, we send 10 B-50s, which was a B, an atomic capable B-29, to Guam with the bombs and the cores. And they're sitting there ready to launch if required. Uh, all they need is the president's 
approval, and those aircraft stay there till the end of the war. There are 10 atomic bombs, fully armed, sitting at Guam till the end of the war. And, and in the meantime, there is actually a special headquarters established by LeMay uh, on Guam to command those, those atomic bombs in, in case they have to be used. Now, eventually we know that things settle down, but there's still questions about the, the actual utility of the bombs, and so Ridgeway and LeMay will get together and set up an exercise program called Hudson Harbor. Of all the th research I've done, this is probably what I'm most proud of, because Hudson Harbor is presented in a lot of historical accounts based on very shoddy information as this big plan to intimidate our foes and, and, and broadcast our, our, our willingness to use atomic weapons against them. In reality, it's, a, it's, it's, it's almost the exact opposite. It's, it's a very it's an experiment to see if it's viable in Korea. It's designed so nobody will know we're doing it. It's even hidden from Congress. When a congressional delegation shows up at Guam, LeMay sends orders out to his, his command out there, you guys need to stay low and hide because nobody in Washington knows what we're doing. Like, it's not just LeMay, it's Ridgeway, it's, it's, the whole, it's the whole military. This is a test the military is running that Congress doesn't know about, they don't want them to know about. Uh, and the idea, again, is to test the viability of nuclear weapons. And the way Operation Hudson Harbor worked is that here's Guam down here. So the operation started Guam. They assume a three and a half hour wait because that's how long it'll take to get permission to drop a bomb from Washington. So they wait three and a half hours. They launch the aircraft from Guam. It fly, and, and you can see the map of the United States at the bottom to show how, how long these missions are. And these, these, are rec these are very similar to the B-29 missions over Japan in World War II. But the aircraft flies at a very low altitude till it hits Japan. It then pops up to kind of a normal altitude, so it looks like an aircraft flying out of Japan. There's no way an anybody in Korea or China would have thought that this was anything other than a normal B-29 flying out of Japan. It then flew up over Korea. It, it hit the target zone at about 1,100 Zulu. So it's about, it's about oh, 10 hours flight time to get the target. Plus, remember, there's three and a half hours wait for approval for the clearance. So it's about 13 hours from the time it takes off to the time it gets to the target area. And then it returns to Japan. What they found basically was that by the time they got there and the four missions they ran, they ran one visual mission, which was this one, and, and three by radar at night and overcast. They basically found that in that long a time, the target they thought they were going to bomb had disappeared. Normally it was a troop concentration. By the time they got there, they'd all dispersed or they dug in. They were, it was no longer a viable target. What they found was the time was too long. It's a very disappointing experiment that reinforced the, the reasons why atomic weapons would not be useful in a tactical context in Korea. Didn't end consideration, though. Mark Clark comes in in summer 52. He believes you've got to be hard with the communists. He believes they're not negotiating in good faith, and he develops something called Op Plan 8-52. It includes air and naval ops against Manchuria and the Chinese coast. I'll show you a diagram here in a second. A double envelopment of Pyongyang, amphibious assault at Wonsan, to set up a defense across the, the, the neck. Uh, and, and in the way it evolves, by, by, the, by the, the spring of 1953, when it, the, the plan is briefed to the NSC and to the president and to the JCS, it, the plans include through between 342 and 482 atomic bombs dropped on North Korea and China, or on, on, on most, mostly in Manchuria and China. You're going to take out Shanghai. You're going to take out all the major cities along the Chinese coast. You're going to take out all of Manchuria. Uh, it, it's a very ambitious plan. It's approved by the JCS and, and Ike in 53. In May of 53, it's approved. Actually, if you read the minutes of the NSC meetings in July, the, the president especially is convinced that this is all a ruse, that the communists are not serious, this is all... A, a, a ploy to, to get it, let us get our guard down, and he approves the execution of this plan if the armistice gets broken. On the day the armistice is signed, in the 27th of July, 1953, SAC is on full alert. The maze planes are ready to go, the bombs are prepared to be loaded, and the expectation is that this is just a big trap. 
Now, in my opinion, I think it would have been chaos uh, if it actually tried to be executed. Now, this is my poorly uh, graphed image of the op plan. This is op plan. Again, this is, the goal is to move the front up to this narrow neck. You've got the double the, the drive on Pyongyang. You've got the amphibious assault at Wonsan. They set up the defensive line. You're going to nuke the power plants along the, the Yalu. You're going to nuke Antung. You're going to nuke all the supply points in here, take out a lot of Manchuria. And down here, along the coast, is where all the Shanghai is right here. It's, there's a number of major cities down here. You'd basically take out the Chinese coast down here. You'd so it'd basically be impossible for the Chinese to get any reinforcements in there. Now, one of the things that they didn't know is that there were 1.3 million Chinese troops in North Korea at that time. Would have been a little rough. Also, to be honest, I think trying to get that many bombs into that area would, would have been disastrous. In October 51, the MiGs had already driven the B-29s out of the air over North Korea. They couldn't survive. The MiGs were too deadly. Uh, LeMay is talking about using B-36s to carry bombs into, uh, to drop some of the bombs in these areas. Anybody ever see a uh, the movie Strategic Air Command with Jimmy Stewart. Remember that what happens to the B-36 he flies? It crashes in the Arctic. I mean, for those of you who know anything about the revolt of the admirals, which is basically based on the, on the Navy arguments that B-36 was a piece of crap, they're right. I mean, for all the guff they take, they were correct. The B-36 was an awful aircraft. I found examples in LeMay's papers that if they flew a B-36 from the United States to Korea to drop a bomb, which he never did, he never even flew it there as a, as a demonstration, which they kept trying to make him do, that if the B-36 would fly from the United States to Korea, before it flew back, they'd have to replace every engine. Uh, not a real good piece of equipment. So this would have been, Op Plan 852 would have been, a, there would have been atomic bombs and aircraft falling all over the place, and not where they were supposed to. But thankfully, we never, it never happens. Now, what does happen, though, is, remember, part of this process, if you know the Korean War, is Ike also sends through diplomatic channels threats to the, supposed to get back to the Chinese that he's willing to expand the war to include atomic weapons. Now, the best evidence is those messages never get there. But he doesn't know that by 1964. And I found minutes, well, Casey Brower, some of you may know at West Point, found minutes of a meeting between Ike and LBJ in 1964, and LBJ is talking about uh, going into Vietnam. And LBJ asks Ike, how did you end the Korean War? And this is a direct quote from Andrew Goodpaster's notes. He said he had the word passed through three channels telling Chinese they must agree to the armistice quickly, since he had decided to remove the restrictions of Aryan weapons if the war had to be continued. General Eisenhower said that the greatest danger in his judgment in the present situation, talking about Vietnam, is that the Chinese get the idea we will go just so far and no further in terms of the level of war we would conduct. That would be the beginning of the end since they would know all they had to do was go further than we do. So like believed, you always keep nukes on the table. You've got to make your enemy always afraid you're going to use them. And that's the key part of the leverage you're going to have in any kind of negotiations. He was very much against the gradual escalation. He was very much against any kind of limitations. Though openly. Now, if you read any literature on Ike, he was, you know, he hated nuclear war. He was never really going to do it, but he said you could never admit that. You had to keep your card, that, that card always in play, uh, even if you didn't intend to use it. You never let the enemy know that there was a tool you had in your toolbox you were not going to use. Now, with that, let me turn to the biological warfare. Now, the biological warfare issue springs up in 1952. It starts in February and March 1952. And it's built upon the fact, which is a true one, you know, all great, all great lies are always built upon a foundation of truth. At the end of World, during the latter stage of World War II, actually since from the 30s all the way up through World War II, the Japanese had a unit in, in China called Unit 731 under a command of Lieutenant General Ishii. And what they did was execute chemical and biological warfare experiments on Chinese civilians and prisoners, and in some cases, allied prisoners. What the United States does at the end of World War II, and probably one of the more shameful things we have done in recent memory, is they strike a deal with Ishii and his people 
and give them immunity from any war crimes, war crimes prosecution if you will give us all the data they got from killing these prisoners. And we do that. You know, from what I've seen, though, is the material arrived at Fort Detrick, Maryland, and the people who were there were so disgusted with where it came from, they, they refused to use it. And in most cases, they said, we can find, we can get better data on our own anyway. But the bottom line, though, is Ishii and his guys are, are actually all exonerated. They go back to Japan, and they become prime movers in the Japanese equivalent of the American Medical Association. If you go to Japan and look at the rules they have about human experimentation, they're very different than ours. And they're based on the influence of Ishii and his Unit 731 people uh, and then what they come up with after World War II. And there's still some legacies there. After the initial claim, it starts basically with Japanese, the Chinese newspaper reports, and then it expands into the radio realm. Uh, there's a big Chow and Lai radio broadcast in March. It says the U.S. are flying over the Yalu, which was true. So in, in, even some of the American leaders didn't use it. What was starting to happen in 1952 is, MiG, is, is the, the, most of the Soviet MiG pilots had left the north. The Chinese were left. They weren't as good as the Russians. They were very timid about going over the Yalu. American F-86 pilots knew they could be heroes if they shot down a MiG. So they were all going over the Alu to chase the, the, the MiGs around China without telling their bosses. There was a, I was talking with a couple of them. They had this great thing they called choking the parrot. Four of them would fly up to the Alu, and, and they'd be tracked on the ground by their IFF signals, you know, in, indication friend or foe signals in the aircraft. Well, the, the, the lead aircraft would turn off its IFF. One of the other aircraft would turn their IFF on. Of course, all they could see on the ground was one IFF signal. Two of the aircraft would go across the Yalu to hunt MiGs. The other two, with the IFF on, would fly up and down the Yalu. And they'd wait for the other two aircraft to come back. They'd all join up, and they'd all fly back together. So nobody in the ground knew what was going on. In the meantime, they were all hunting MiGs in, over China. So the Chinese, in, those that were setting up these accusations, said all these incursions, why were they coming over? Well, obviously, they're doing it to drop biological warfare all over China. And they, they sent photos. They released photos to the press. I'll show an example of those in a second. They uh, expanded to claim the fact that we were supposedly spreading hoof and mouth disease in Canada, and they blamed us for a, a swarm of locusts in the Middle East. The main purpose for these, as best we can tell looking in hindsight, was to deal with epidemics and to try to explain to the, to the, to the Chinese people themselves where these, a lot of their epidemics were coming from. This is, a, this is a page in the New York Times which shows the photos that were released from the Chinese to the world press and allegations of the biological warfare. The American scientists basically discounted them all. They, you know, they said, you know, this one is a, is, a, is a bug with its wings pulled off. A uh, number of them, they said, these are normal flies. They're nothing special. You couldn't get a bacteria in them anyway. Now, the one interesting piece is these, these bombs here are leaflet bombs, which they said, here are bombs that were dropped. They didn't explode. Therefore, they must be biological warfare bombs. Actually, what they were were bombs full of leaflets, you know, the propaganda leaflets. They, you, so they dropped these special bombs with them. The irony, though, of this is eventually the BW guys, after reading some of the propaganda, say, you know, those things actually could be BW bombs. So they eventually do decide they're going to use, if they get a drop biological warfare, they're going to use these leaflet bombs to carry the biological warfare. So they get that kind of inspiration from some of the, the Chinese accusations. But, the, but over here is an article, Reds Fail to Halt Epidemic in China. Communist official declares 10 million infected with intestinal diseases. What's going on in China, there are, there are all kinds of public health problems with epidemics. And the main purpose of this of these biological warfare accusations is going to be to really motivate North Korean and Chinese public health programs. Very effective in that respect. Um, but again, the, the, the pictures are easily, uh, these, in this case, the pictures are very easily refuted by scientific uh, evidence. That's not where, they don't end there, though. The, the North Koreans and Chinese invite two specially selected groups, one a bunch of lawyers, one a bunch of, scient of, of scientists, all, of course, communist 
most of them communist members or communist sympathizers to come over and investigate uh, on the ground. Uh, the North, they created false infestation maps. When these groups showed up, they showed a map and says, here's where the biological warfare has been dropped. We'll take you to the area to check it out. They gathered cholera and flag bacilli from infected, uh, infected, from their own infected citizens, injected them in prisoners they had. Uh, uh, you know, these were criminals, you know, but, but again, they were, they were North Koreans. They injected the material into them. They buried the, after they died, they buried the bodies, and then they conveniently let the observers find these bodies and dig them up and analyze and say, wow, these guys died from the plague. This person died from, from cholera. And so that convinced both groups the acquisition, accusations are true. Now, how do we know that all this stuff was going on? Well, in that brief time in the 1990s when the, the Soviet archives opened up, there was a Japanese researcher showed up in, in, in one of the, the Soviet archives, or then Russian archives, and got to see all these documents where the, 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 the Soviets found out about the fabrication that was going on. It, it, there was explanations of what North... Mo, these, it was mostly done by mid-level North Koreans. I mean, to, to, to give the Chinese some credit, they didn't know that the fabrication was going on. It was... It, it, and, and what happens, though, is that is the... The Soviets find out, they say, look, we've looked into this, we know you guys are falsifying this stuff, cut it out. Or they recommended, we recommend you cease it because you're going to get caught and we'll all be embarrassed. So about right after that message is sent, accusations cease. There's no more North Korean or Chinese accusations after that. Uh, but the, in many ways, the damage has already been done. And there's other things that go on as well. Now, the U.S. response, how do you deal with these accusations? The first thing they do is they go to the UN and they say, we want the World Health Organization and the Red Cross to investigate these, these things, and they pass a resolution and the Russians veto it. They, they analyze the UN, there's a bunch of psychological warfare agencies, analyze this, say this is the core of a new Russian hate campaign against the United States. It's going to be the core of a whole bunch of other things. Uh, when Jacob Malik, the USSR rep, is, is the head of the National Security Council for their month, he brings up, he wants to bring up the issue for debate in the UN, but the United States is, is ready for it. And the UN, rep the American UN representative very adroitly shifts the discussion to, you know, if we're going to talk about this, we really ought to investigate it first, and, and turns it right back to the investigation thing. It ends up with a, with a, with a, a, a unanimous vote for it, except for the Soviet veto again. That is portrayed in press coverage and newsreels, showing the Soviet veto. And the Department of State and Matthew Ridgway deny the accusations very strongly. There's a very, very, very tough campaign that we're not doing it. Now, Wayland is in the middle of this. And, and he's listening and he's watching the debate and watching all the flurry. And he basically says, why don't we just admit we don't have any capability to do this sort of stuff? And he is... The, the State Department guy, everybody goes nuts. We can't do that. We can't admit we can't do it. Let's show our sign of weakness. Uh, you know, part of that is because the main fear of what the communist campaign was for was the communist campaign. Why would they, okay, you guys are staff officers sitting in Washington. All of a sudden, out of nowhere comes these accusations we're using biological warfare in Korea. Why would they do that? What reasons could you come up with? Well, there's two, there's two schools of thought. One is, they just want to find out what we have. They're trying to goad us into revealing our capabilities. But the, but the one that carries the most weight is, you know, the reason they're doing this is because they're getting ready to do it to us. And this is their cover. They can say, well, the, they did it to us first, now we can do it to them. So the end result of that is it, it, put, it, it, it spurs a massive program to get our own biological warf warfare capability both offensive and defensive. A whole bunch of money starts getting to put into things like making anthrax plants and, and, and figuring out ways to, you know, and neat ways to kill things and what kind of bacteria we can use and what kind of diseases and, how to, and how also how to, how to prevent them. Um, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it, 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 it causes, um, a, a, again, it's amazing to me how much it actually spurs American efforts to develop BW weapons. Then it's magnified again, beginning in, in May 1952, all of a sudden, Chinese radio broadcasts start to include American airmen 
um, confessing to dropping biological weapons on North Korea and China. Eventually, 38 will do this. 38 airmen will confess to dropping biological warfare. Uh, now, some of them, as Al Millet has found, I think it's going to be uh, come out in his latest book that comes out, his third volume of his Korean War trilogy, which comes out pretty soon. He found that some of them confessed to biological warfare because they knew about the Op Plan 852. They knew the nukes could, could be dropped, and they, they did that to distract their captors from questions about nukes. Um, one of the things I find that, that the, all of these claims are very carefully investigated by the Air Force uh, and denied by the State Department. The uh, recovering these prisoners became a top priority. I found orders to Mark Clark that basically said, he, they listed um, a, a, couple, a couple of Marines and a bunch of Air Force officers, the, the six that they felt were the top. They'd made the biggest confessions, got the biggest splash. They said, we want these six especially. If they are not released in the prisoner exchange, you have permission to go in with clandestine forces and get them, whatever it costs. We want those six. Uh, I want to talk about one in particular, a lieutenant named John Quinn. B-26 pilot shot down uh, in, in early 52. Uh, is one of the earliest taped radio confessions. He's actually interviewed by a French uh, communist in June 1952. Uh, he talks about you know, that how well he's being treated and the fact that, I mean, it really is, is, is sad. You know, I'm not testifying against the people of the United States, but just against a handful of insane people who made us do this. He names 21 people who were, did this with him. Uh, you know, he's, he, he, he's saying he's doing this for world peace. Uh, it, it's pretty sad. And uh, his claims were investigated in great detail. Uh, and I actually found a copy of the file where they are investigated. And I thought the most, the most interesting part, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, here it is, right here. They, they, he actually, they caught a Canadian citizen coming in from China with a copy of a film. When they were coming through Canadian customs, the Canadian customs seized the film, and the film was a filmed confession of Quinn describing his biological warfare missions. And so, Typical Air Force uh, thoroughness, they said, well, we, we need to check this out. So we'll, his wife is living in, in California, so they said, let's go show the movie to his wife. So they, they detailed an Air Force chaplain to go show the movie to his wife, and I found the report from the Air Force chaplain on the film. The film was shown at 1300, 15 April 1953, with only Mrs. Quinn and I in the room. The projectionist was not cleared for conf confidential, so I had him thread the machine, and then they sent him out of the room. I made a few statements, and the film was shown in its entirety once, and the part was focusing on Lieutenant Quinn the second time. The reaction of Mrs. Quinn to the film was mature and objective. She is a stable, well-oriented person and revealed no unusual emotion. She is strongly anti-communist, as was her husband, and her most pertinent comment was, how in the world could he do it? She has letters from her husband written during cadet days and since, which reveal his ultra-patriotic spirit. It seemed an anomaly to her he could have been induced to make statements favorable to communism. He's never been cynical or bitter regarding the United States or the Air Force. Her comments were as follows. John has aged terrifically, appears quite haggard. His smile or grin seems ashamed or cynical, not typical of him. His speech was halting. His hands are active. His eyes did not have the usual expression. They were strained. I, I've never seen him in that kind of suit, she also said. W women would pick that up. The main question in Mrs. Quinn's mind, is my husband going to be court-martialed for this? She was informed the Air Force does not contemplate any action other than rehabilitation of these prisoners of war. She also wondered if her husband had any permanent psychological damage, uh, but answered that she thought he would straighten himself out once he got home and she had a chance to work with him. You know, the, Mrs. Quinn was grateful to the Air Force for making it possible for her to see her husband. That's, so that's the, the report that went in. Now, Quinn is one of the people that is, is, is there looking for him. And, when, and as soon as, as, soon as he's, he's grabbed from the armistice group and he's actually brought back quickly to the United States where he issues a sworn statement on the 
see the date of this, 23 September 53, which talks about what happened to him. And, and I've actually, the reason I bring Quinn up is because I've actually had email exchanges with Lieutenant Quinn. And, and, the, and it's really some of the saddest emails I've ever, I've ever exchanged. And, and Quinn said, you know, I, I, I gave a whole bunch of balderdash. I said a whole bunch of things. And, and if you read the Air Force investigations, it's obvious. They say, this stuff is all wrong. Obviously, these persons are under duress and are trying to feed out a lot of false information. But he said, you know, I never believed in it, that anyone would ever believe any of it. I never thought any of this would be believed. And, and he said, it just something, you know, I'll never live it down. I mean, it was just really sad emails. This is like 50 years after the event. Uh, but he goes through and, and he talks about what happened, that, you know, they stuck him in a, in a cave for, for five months with another airman in the middle of winter. Uh, then, then they stuck him there eight months in solitary confinement. He couldn't stand up. He only got one tin of filthy water a day and a little bit of rice. He, he said, my life was never threatened, but I was always isolated. They had three interrogators on me all the time, working on me to say something. And he said, you know, once I said something, they'd build on it with something else. My greatest fear was I knew my wife and, and, and was pregnant, and I was worried that she would, you know, some of it I did so she would know I was still alive. But once he started down the slope, they pushed him further and further. And that there's no code of conduct in 1952. Uh, but it, it's just sad with the exchanges I've had with Lieutenant Quinn since. I, I, this for years, I don't know if he's still alive or not. But it was something he was still living with and something that uh, he just could not, could not forget. Uh, this is another case, Walker Mahurin, uh, F-86 pilot who shot down. This is his account in the New York Times. Talked about the pressures designed to break him down. Uh, what, they, what they were, again, they, 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 and he's, he's captured right near the end of the war. Uh, you know, he talks about that, uh, let's see. He said, I spent, I spent, at one time I spent 38 hours straight sitting at rigid attention at the edge of my bed. Another time I spent 33 days sitting at rigid attention on the edge of a stool for 20 hours a day. You know, they, they, they just phys put him through a physical strain to wear him down with interrogators beating him all the time. Uh, eventually, he, uh, they, they tell him they're not going to let him go until, until he signs a confession. He finally signs. They dictate it to him. He signs it. And they fi he find out the war's been over for a month. And they bet they held him to get that last confession before they sent him back. But he's another one of these guys who knew the nuke plan. He knew about 852. That's another thing that's come. To, he didn't talk about it in his, in his recantation, but that came out later. He, you know, he, he does this partly so that they, you know, he start, he's starting to weaken. He knows he's gonna, he might fail. He'd rather give him some balderdash about BW than, than start giving up stuff about nukes. Now, international impact. Again, the most significant impact is it drives the North Korean and Chinese public health programs. There are programs that clean out all the streets in China, kill every bug, North Koreans do the same thing. It leads to a great drop in the epidemic rates, ranked uh, epi yeah, economic rates. There are examples, though, where some Chinese units actually panic and run away when there are fears that biological warfare is being dropped. There are cases of unit, Chinese units breaking just under the rumor of American biological warfare. Uh, accusations go all over the Eastern European and Asian press. The only place they have any real impact is in India and Pakistan where they reinforce anti-American, and it's seen as typical American actions against Asians. Uh, it does inspire some actions against captured, North Korean, or captured American airmen by North Korean civilians. The best story is those is, uh, I found a story, a bunch, of, a bunch of NCOs at a prison camp, and they're hearing about all these rumors about biological warfare. So what they do is they catch all the beetles and things they can around the camp, and, and they've got some whiteout or something, and they put on the back of all the bugs, U.S. Mark 7. <laughs> and then they let them out all over the camp, and they said all the guards ran away. <laughs> they had a great old time. Typical NCOs, you know, they're going to exploit any opportunity they have. Now, again, this drives, though, American biological warfare programs. Uh, 
the, uh, there is immense effort put into it. Uh, the, by 53, we do have, oops, we do have chemical capabilities in the theater, but bombs, not, not, not agents. They realize that the problem with the chemical agents, and they've got a lot of them, uh, they've got 35,000 tons of phosgene and cyanogen chloride, 20,000 tons of mustard, 400 tons of nerve gas, all back in the United States. And they've got factories making 5,000 tons a month of mustard and about 1,000 tons a month of phosgene and cyanogen chloride. So the CW business is really booming in the United States in 1953. But they realize that it's going to be very bad publicity if they start shipping that stuff across the United States. And it's going to be even worse if they try to move it across Japan. So it's all sitting back in the United States. The max real biological capability is described in the reports as a mock attack with incapacitating bacterium, Brucella Swiss, which basically makes you sick, against 3,000 guinea pigs on a practice range. That's all we can really do. Uh, we do have plans to build a big anthrax plant in Arkansas, which comes online in 1954. So we start to develop an anthrax capability, though the realization is we wouldn't be able to get that into, into the uh, uh, Eastern Theater until 1955. In the meantime, we do have 2,500 tons of anti-crop anti -crop rust, 5,000 tons of anti-crop chemicals, and 24,000 bombs ready to fill if we want to use it. But again, all we have is really anti-crop rust. And what comes up, and they start talking about, well, is there a better way to de deliver that against the Soviet Union? So some bright-eyed guy in, in the R&D says, you know, with the prevailing winds over the Soviet Union, if we could develop balloons... We could put the crop, the anti-crop stuff in balloons, we could wipe out the Russian wheat crops and oat crops. And who has the main contract for those balloons? General Mills does. That's where the Cheerios box comes up. We have the company that makes Cheerios that has the, the system to destroy all the oats and wheat in the Soviet Union. What a deal. I wonder if there was any other motivation for that than public service. I want to close with a little debate, and then I'll open, open the questions here. And a couple, I'll talk about this in a few legacies. And, and there's a couple of, of conferences in 52 about this that are held. And uh, there are some interesting documents that come out of these. The, uh, on the left is Jimmy Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle is probably the most ethical of the airmen I've run into in my research in World War II. He hated bombing cities. He tried to stop the bombing of Berlin. He didn't like, uh, he, would, he wouldn't do any mass bombing at all. He said that the precision bombing was the most, eth most ethical way to fight. And he became the uh, U.S. Air Force Special Assistant for Science and Technology. He attended a, a meeting in, in April 52 looking at biological warfare capabilities within OSD. And he made a final closing statement before he left. He says, from everything I've heard today, despite the sometimes note of pessimism, it appears to me the considerable problem inherent in the selection, development, production, and use of suitable biological warfare agents are in no way insuperable. I'm satisfied this competent group of people here, together with interested agencies working together, can and will promptly solve the problems necessary to give us an operational biological warfare agent, and with it, the substantial increase in our offensive capacity and substantially increased national security. You know, and he goes through and he says the accusation of the Russians are probably to find out what we have. Uh, you, know, you know, he said it'd be it would be stupid for us to tell us what we have. He also says we could also have said stupidly we will never use BW first. That would be an important information important information for them to get, which actually was the policy then. Our national policy was no BW except in retaliation. Now he closed though. He said I'd like to deal for just a minute with the moral aspect of this. This is Jimmy Doolittle, the most moral of American airmen in World War II. In my estimation, we have just one moral obligation. That moral obligation is for us to develop at the earliest possible moment that agent which will kill enemy personnel most quickly and most cheaply. And I speak of cheaply in connection with our national resources and contend that our most valuable national resource is our own young people. And that's how he closed his remarks. And that's how he summed up He's termed the morality of biological warfare. A couple months later, Thomas K. Finletter, the Secretary of the Air Force, sent a note to Secretary Pace, the, direct, the Secretary of the Army, talking about this. He'd been reading a bunch of reports on this biological warfare stuff. 
Then he has a couple operational questions, like where's the Navy fit in? How are we going to use these things? But he has another paragraph and he says, my biggest problem is, what is our philosophy about the use of, the, use of these weapons from the moral point of view and the military point of view? Do we accept the recommendations of, the, of others that we should abandon the retaliatory principle and treat these like any other weapons? It seems to me we really have to answer that question first before we look at any questions about military deployment. It really bothered Finletter about, you know, what do I, these weapons are somehow different. We really need to, they're not like any other weapon. We've got to think about how we really want to use them and what they really mean. Now let's talk about some legacies, and then I'll close. Bottom line, the Chinese and North Koreans still believe the allegations. There's a number of Chinese books about it. The North Koreans, it's in their museums. Uh, they believe the allegations. Again, I've looked at it from our side. It's not the fact that I believe all the stuff that the, this Japanese guy got out of the archives. I just know we couldn't have done it. I've seen the operational files. We didn't have the capability to do what we were accused of doing. Uh, Eisenhower's fears come true. You know, the, the, you have this, the 50s feature, this, this spur development, in biological and nuclear programs, Eisenhower's new look. But after Korea and Vietnam especially, our nuclear deterrent begins to lose its credibility. I talked with the guys who wrote Airland Battle Drock in the 1980s, and one of the primary motivators for them coming up with Airland Battle Drock in 1982 was because of a realization we were not going to use nukes to fight, to fight the Soviets. We had to find a way to fight without nukes. We weren't going to do it. Even though, you know, I, Jim Keeve and I, we went through all the war games in the 70s, and the final solution was, after you've been wiped out, you had two tanks left against the Russian hordes, you called in the nukes, and you nuked them. That was the solution to all our war games. You eventually went to nukes. By the 80s, we realized we weren't going to do that. We had to come up with a better way to do it. Now, LeMay's attitude of biological warfare was borne out, too. He said, basically, why are we wasting effort on biological warfare when we got nukes? Nukes are a lot more sure. They can't, the wind can't blow them the other way. You know what they're going to do. Don't put your money in BW. Put it in nukes. And that's the way the United States has gone. Though BW still remains a poor man's weapon. But the questions about the ethics, effectiveness, and international, international reaction about WMD remain for all strategic leaders, and we're watching them play out in Syria right now. So with that, let me open it up for questions. You've been a good audience. Apologize we started a little late, but appreciate your attention. Any of you have, have stock in General Mills, they don't make the balloons anymore. Were these bombs uh, similar to World War II type or much more destructive? The, the atomic, atomic weapons? What, what they've, it's, it's interesting what they do. In the, in the early days of Korean War, I found records where they're talking about using 12 bombs to try to stop the North Koreans, and that would almost wiped out our inventory. And they were very similar to the World War II type of bombs. But shortly thereafter, they developed a technology to make bombs that can carry by fighter bombers. It's a much smaller nuke. So by, by the time we get to 53, they've got hundreds of these smaller nukes. So they developed technology to make them smaller. So it's, it's got the same punch with a smaller package. And of course, in 54, we get the H-bomb, which really drives the destruction capacity off the scale. But, so, the, but, but the, so the big change is smaller bombs. They develop smaller bombs by 52. Other questions? You mentioned earlier about the tragedy and the heartbreak. Can you talk about the tragedy and the heartbreak? Oh, there, there you go. Um, sir, I just wanted to uh, clarify uh, Bradley's uh, quote um, wrong war with the wrong enemy at the wrong, at the wrong time. About MacArthur. Yeah, no, that, Bradley, uh, among the Joint Chiefs, Bradley could be very critical of MacArthur. Uh, every time, though, MacArthur, but he wouldn't say anything to MacArthur. I mean, Bradley was, would, just wouldn't deal with MacArthur. When, when they had to have somebody deal with MacArthur, they sent George Marshall. I mean, everybody was intimidated by MacArthur. It wasn't just Bradley. But, but it also struck me that Bradley was also intimidated by Eisenhower. Uh, I just, you know, my personal opinion on Omar Bradley as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, 
is he was the perfect guy for Truman because he never pushed back against anything. He was very much a yes man for Truman. He was a good figurehead to put up there, five-star general. But I, I don't have a very high opinion of his, of his own. He, you know, he, he, he was a good servant. I mean, he was. But he, he wasn't, uh, he, he wasn't going to push his own agenda. He was not going to, uh, I mean, it's, it's a different setup as well. I mean, the, the, the agent of the, term, of the Joint Chiefs for Korea is Collins. The Army has that field. So most of the issues with Korea are handled by Collins, not by the chairman. But Bradley just doesn't stand up to MacArthur or Ike during this period. And, and he was very critical of MacArthur. He says one of the reasons he, he relieves MacArthur, I found some papers. You see, he told people, one of the reasons I relieved MacArthur, I didn't trust him with nukes. He knew those nukes were in Guam, and he was afraid that MacArthur would try to use them. He didn't trust them. Ike didn't trust MacArthur. One of the other statements in that, in that, June, in that June meeting where he comes in on June 28th, uh, the last thing that, uh, that Ridgway writes, the last thing that Ike says, in commenting upon General MacArthur, Ike expressed the wish that he would like to see a younger general out there rather than, as he expressed it, an untouchable whose actions you cannot predict and who will himself decide what information he wants Washington to have and what he will withhold. So there's a number of people, of course, you know, Eisenhower had worked under MacArthur and that was a very bad relationship and there's a lot of bad feelings there. But the bottom line, though, is nobody's going to confront MacArthur, especially after Inchon. After everybody, you know, Don Booth's the expert on Inchon, everybody tells MacArthur Inchon's not going to work. MacArthur does it, it works, and, and at that point, People were loath to approach MacArthur with questions before. Now nobody's going to question him because he had just shown them all to be fools. So that, that, that furthered his, his hubris. But again, just another thing on that, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the, the mic gets where it's going on. There's actually a little book I found in 1954 that was used in American schools which talks about the, the, the Truman-MacArthur controversy. And the way it's expressed is not that MacArthur is, is, is it's not civil-military relations, it's how do you fight communism. And, 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 is MacArthur right that you've got to fight it all out wherever you face it, or is Truman right that you, you, you've got to hold your, you, you don't, you, you, you husband your resources, you don't take the big risks. I mean, the, the issue is how do you fight communism, not civil-military relations. It's a very different perception in the 50s of what MacArthur was doing. Yes, questions? Yes. Um, if I might, might make one comment and then a question, your, your discussion of the um, psychological pressure on the imprisoned Americans, um, which you described as very sad, obviously, and, and uh, destructive, uh, the United States adopted some of those techniques uh, in the current war against uh, quote-unquote terrorism, uh, very explicitly using uh, the Chinese um, background, the Chinese uh, model, which is also very sad. Uh, my question is whether, and I appreciate your, your talk very much, um, whether we're looking back on WMD from a, uh, today's perspective rather than looking forward from how they looked at it. And WMD, of course, is a, is a modern terminology. Uh, in 1950, 51, 52, the question of strategic bombing, of mass bombing, um, was not as distinguished from nuclear bombing as it is today. It was, it, obviously, in uh, World War II, the, the question of destruction of cities, of civilian targets, uh, was seen as problematic. And so the United States, while it did not engage in nuclear bombing or biological weapons, as you said, uh, did engage in what many would have considered mass destruction at the time, um, destruction of dikes, uh, destruction of irrigation, f irrigated fields, things like that. And coming after the Nuremberg trials, the crimes against humanity, you know, that's the type of thing that people at the time, or at least some people, were looking at. In your research, did you see any discussion of the ethics or the or the pragmatism, which is really what you were talking about, about those techniques, the mass bombings of... I didn't uh, read the rest of my book. Uh, but let, let me, let but me you, tell you. You I've get read, my idea. You get the point. I, I get the idea. The, 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 the point is, if you look through the studies, even though people, you know, LeMay burnt down 60-some Japanese cities, killed, killed 100,000 Japanese in the fire raid in Tokyo, the, the, 
you know, the raids, Dresden, the, the numbers are highly inflated for Dresden and some of those other ones. But, but the, the key thing is, if you read through the staff studies, people realized that the, the nuclear weapons were different. The, the method of destruction was different. The degree was different. I've got some great exchanges with Harry Truman when he had one of his constituents wrote and said, I heard, a, I heard a discussion where you might be reluctant to use the atomic bomb, glad you used one in Japan. You're just like any other weapon, shouldn't worry about that. And Truman writes back a very short note and says, there's a congressman. He says, congressman, you're mistaken. I, I, atomic bombs are very different and much more horrible than anything, we, anything else we have. And I'm not going to use one again, basically. And, and so it's, they were seen as different. The world saw them as different. And that's where there's a lot of concern about a, a, a bad demonstration of them. Because that we had this clout, we didn't want to lose it. The people kind of, even though the, the conventional bombing was terrible, it was not considered, it was more acceptable. It still get, but it wasn't seen as crossing any kind of a line. You weren't gonna, you weren't gonna blow up the world. You weren't gonna cause World War III with conventional bombing. So that it was even then seen as something different. And, and that the biological warfare is, is kind of a new thing uh, you're right. We, we don't talk about biological, chemical, and nukes as weapons of mass destruction. We're going to use chemical weapons in Op Plan 852 also. There's all these studies about how vulnerable the Chinese and North Koreans are to chemical weapons, too. Uh, but but, but the, even in 1951, 1950, atomic weapons are seen as different. They're just seen as... And, and of course, as I said, when the H-bomb appears, everybody sees it as vastly different. I mean, it, it, it's... You know, we're talking a quantum leap in destructive power that there are no doubters after 1954 when the H-bomb appeared. But that's good questions. And on that, you read through the torture stuff, that you, we didn't go as far as the Chinese did with some of these airmen, but you're correct that some of the, you can compare some of the techniques that were used, especially early on in the war on terror with some of the things the Chinese, the deprivation, the isolation. So we didn't do it for eight months or, you know, we didn't, didn't freeze, get, get people frostbite of their feet like the Chinese did, but but there are some similarities. All right, sir, we'll take one more back in the corner. Well, you talked about General Mills there are going to uh, screw up their farming. <clears throat> Did they ever think about just dropping regular bombs on rice paddies and farms and tearing up wheat fields, just carpet bombing, that type of thing? Well, what they did in Korea in, in, in May of 53, there are, there are, they do target the irrigation dams in North Korea. What happens, though, is it's, uh, Wayland, Wayland is, 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 he's kind of old fashioned too, and they go to Wayland and they say we want to bomb his, 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 bottom line, by 53 they're desperate for targets, they've run out of targets, they're trying to find leverage to get the, to, to have some effect at the peace table, they bomb hydroelectric plants, they burnt down every city in North Korea basically, there's nothing left to attack, so what do we get attacked? Well we'll attack, the last thing left is we have the, 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 the dikes protecting the rice paddies. And if we take out the dikes, we'll flood the rice paddies. Maybe we'll cause starvation. Who knows? So they go to O.P. Whalen. They say, Whalen, we want to, or General, we want to do this. And Whalen says, no, that's inhumane. We're not going to bomb food crops. You don't do that thing. Then they go back and they say, hmm. Then they go back to, to, to tell you what, General, we have this transportation campaign. We're trying to knock out the, uh, the North Korean rail lines. There's this one key rail line right here. Uh, it's hard to knock out, but if we knock out this dike, the water is going to rush down and wipe out the rail line. And he says, okay, I'll allow that. So they go out, they bomb the dike, washes out the rail line, also washes 27 miles down and washes out the city of Pyongyang. The North Koreans aren't stupid. They realize the reason that happened is because the lake behind the dike was full. So they do two things. They set up anti-aircraft defenses around, around all their dikes, and they lower the water level in the lakes. So the next time the Air Force attacks and blows the dam up, nothing happens because there's no water there. So then that, killed, that, that kills that, and the Air Force runs out of targets, and then but Stalin dies, and all kinds of things happen, and they sign the armistice. But, but it's, it's I mean, the problem is, is, is you know, escalation goes up. Is, is these, again, we basically destroy every city in North Korea. We burn them all down there. We, we, we have a target list of every building in North Korea because it shelters supplies and troops. Uh, the, one of the main reasons the North Koreans have a, a nuclear weapons program today and a missile program today is because they're not going to let that happen again. And they see that as, a, you know, there, there's a guy named Selig Harrison who writes about North Korea who says the main motivation for the North Korean 
missile and nuclear program is to avoid a repeat of 1953 when we basically burned down North Korea. They're going to make sure the Americans can never do that again. We'll, we'll give Chuck an aid. We'll give Chuck a uh, back, here. back here in the back. Thank you, Ken. Can you go back to your uh, legacy slide, please? Legacy slide, okay. Right. You don't like that one? Oh. That's what I got that from the Marines. I'm yeah, thinking, go ahead. I'm thinking about the lessons learned. I just read a uh, 1987 parameter speech by some major that had the title Korea and the Never Again Club. So part of this process here, again, the lessons that the U.S. military took uh, never again facing uh, the civil military connection between their civilian leaders. How did this apply to the Never Again Club, the use of biological nuclear weapons? Okay, the nuclear weapons stuff? Biological or nuclear weapons, this restrictions on use of munitions in the conduct of war. Well, I mean, it, it was, there's, you know, arguably that the, there are a lot of complaints out of Vietnam, of course, on restrictions that we were held back. But it's, it's, and personally, I got to say that I'm one of these guys that thinks we had to drop a nuke in everybody every 50 years just to remind them we do that sort of thing. But uh, I, I think your the audience, think you took that much better than audiences normally do. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's one of those things, that, you know, that, that, that there, there's, it's called, you know, there's books called Korea, the first war we lost. There's a lot of dissatisfaction with limited war in the first place. And there's a lot of, you know, the 50s is a big period of writing about limited war, and Korea becomes the big case study, which the students are going to realize here when they get into it. Uh, a lot of discussions about it, but again, it hasn't, every, everybody re realizes that atomic weapons is an, is, is an extra step. And whereas the, 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 you look at the Soviet literature, they accepted, if we're going to go to war, nuclear weapons will be a part of that. It's just, it, along with biological stuff and chemical stuff. We have not seen it that way. We have, and I, I don't know of any military people except for Tommy Power, who succeeds LeMay, really is the real model for Jack D. Ripper and Dr. Strangelove, who really argues that, that we need to consider nukes just like any other weapon. I mean, Americans just haven't quite seen that. You know, Power is the only guy who actually testified against the nuclear test ban treaty in 1962. Of course, he's writing, he's writing on Vietnam. Okay. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I'd like to take two seconds to very quickly introduce Colonel Matt Dawson uh, to make a quick presentation. Ah, another charge. I won't take much time. I've had the pleasure of knowing Khan for almost 20 years next year. Uh, yeah, and I've learned a lot from him, continue to learn from him here at uh, the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center. I'd like to thank you for the presentation. I'm sure that I speak for everybody uh, when I say thanks for the presentation and for your work on this and all that you do for the United States Army and the nation. A round of applause for Tom. Let me just, let me just say one thing about the picture on this chart. Uh, when I said we wouldn't use atomic weapons in Korea against our enemies, we were willing to use atomic weapons in Nevada against our own troops. And this is an example of one of the, the nuclear tests we ran in Nevada on our own people to see the effects of the weapon. How did they get them to do it? They promised them a free night in Las Vegas. That's how they got everybody to volunteer to do it. <laughs>